The Green Crow Inn, a novel by Derek A. Camon, read by Kelman Friedman. Chapter 9. Beambacks. It was too cold for open windows. The sounds of chant hummed, albeit muffled, through the walls. The words were unintelligible, but the tones were stark and beautiful. When it seemed the oak beams of the inn itself would begin vibrating in chorus, the sound burst forth, unhindered with the clattering of the front doors. I could hear them snap open even from my place on the second floor. I dashed downstairs. My heart pounded. Hoping I was not obviously sweaty and negligent, I burst through the kitchen and into the common room. The chant now overcame all sound, a tidal wave of glory that caused the hairs on my neck to stand and, as swiftly as it had arrived, it receded. Calca saw me and squinted. I stopped, turned, and retreated to the stove, having been reminded of the fruit. The partridge berries had, in fact, been overcooked. Not wholly immolated, I noticed, after a brief inspection, but I reckoned they were ruined. I swiftly moved the pot off the heat, and, taking a deep breath, smoothed my disheveled tunic with both hands. Oh, no... My tunic was smooth, but there was a protrusion at the waist, and I knew exactly what it was. I had pocketed the brooch! My heart raced again, and there is no doubt that had anyone walked in on me, they would have seen a madman and know my guilt on sight. I scratched my head, groaned softly, and made all manner of odd, frustrated sounds. But there was nothing to be done then. Perhaps I could return it later. Perhaps I was done for. Praying for the best, I left the kitchen. The common area was now filled by nearly a dozen figures, all dressed in olive green tunics and low, rough spun hoods. Their boots were all of similar make as well, that being soft brown leather laced at the top with white string. They positively blended into the dull green walls of the inn. Judging by height and beard protrusion, the troop was an even number of men and dwarves. The curiosity of it all resided not in their chanting, their odd appearance, nor a disparate mix of persons, but in what each carried on their back. Trees. Well, saplings, I suppose, would be the more accurate term. I did, after all, have a season of botany and dendrology on my record. So, each bore across their shoulders a pack apparently made of burlap with a faint bit of soil and a young sapling inside. It was obvious even among those who stood facing me, for little branches and leaves protruded over the tops of their heads. A few kept what were clearly deciduous trees, oak and beech and so on. Some other breeds I'd not seen. A few bore pines. Their appearance was such a delightful distraction that it took a moment for me to notice a pair of unfamiliar faces in the corner. The couple from room 21 sat and watched the beambacks as closely as I did and genuinely paid me no heed. I swallowed the lump in my throat and carried on as inconspicuously as I was able to in spite of my rattled nerves. Certainly, I would return the brooch later. Before Calca could properly greet the tree-bearers, a rather stout dwarf, their leader, or choir-master at least, sang out in a lovely monotone. In the nineteenth timber, beseeching our beatific glorious celestial boreal loving liege of lumber. In whose unsullied name we march, spreading seed and stock in security, knowing with full knowing that she will one day. He carried on like this for, I felt, a rather long time. Even the stolid innkeeper showed signs of wear, shifting her weight and pursing her mouth. Finally, the choir master finished with. Proclaiming and praying and singing. The rest of the lot struck up the hymn and chanted, perhaps louder than before, or perhaps louder for reverberations that came from the vaulted ceiling of the common room as they took their seats. Finally, Kalka, with a forced smile, raised her hands. Gentlemen! she shouted. All chanting ceased. Hey! called a loud and distinctly feminine voice from the back. Sorry, she said. Good people, welcome to the Green Crow. How can I help? Naogi looked at her with thankful eyes. He appeared to be hurting from all the noise. The old dwarf, who had offered no sign of departure from the inn despite weeks of residence, took his mug and made the steep trip up to the balcony. I assumed his relocation was for some peace and quiet, but he would have none. The choir master stepped towards Kalka. Good innkeeper! He chanted again, drawing out the last syllable with vibrato. Then, 
He cleared his throat again, and began again, in a normal speaking voice, low and rasping. Sorry. Force of habit. We require only bread and water. He remembered to smile, bowed, and returned to his seat. Kalka looked to Sumi, who dashed off to the kitchen. Then the chanting started again, albeit with polite restraint. The sound of droning voices was creating a pleasant atmosphere, and soothing now, more so than the overwhelming crash they'd led with. Kalka slid through the drone with practiced greatness, swiftly placing glasses and pouring clear water from a clay pitcher. I watched her from behind the bar. Her story was still unclear to me. How long had she really been innkeeper, and by what means did she gain such a property? She seemed to have amorous eyes for Elgad and Shatan both, but had she ever been married? Married to her work, I suppose. So very curious. My head snapped to the right before I knew why. Somebody was tapping on the lovely, freshly polished bar top. Fearsome must have been the look in my eye, for the perpetrator ceased immediately. It was one of our tree friends, a dwarf judging by the plated blonde beard, sitting apart from his fellows. I replaced my disdainful look with a smile. You are all beanbags, yes? The way the dwarf's head moved backwards said he was surprised. Yes, I mean, yes, of course. I nodded in what must have looked an informed way. Yes, I've seen you lot a few times out and about, always on the move. Always on the move, yes. Spreading the good acorn here and there and all that. I nodded again. Say, the beanback leaned towards me. Could I maybe just have a... Uh, y- you know. And he spread thumb and index finger apart, indicating just how much beer he might like. My reply was an exaggerated wink, and I furtively took a clay mug rather than a glass to one of the taps. What's your name? I asked. Oh, we don't often use names, but I am Blet. Blet? Blet, he said cheerfully. The froth of the twin hype ale, at least I think that's what it was, could scarcely be seen at eye level, but the smell of hops and citrus surely gave it away. I carefully set the mug on the bar atop a cloth coaster. Blet, won't your fellows be upset about this? He frowned, which dropped the tip of his beard another inch or so. I could see his eyes shifting beneath the shadow of his hood. Nah, he said comfortably and supped. The sigh he emitted spoke of a pleasure nearly forgotten and sent bits of froth from his mustache in my direction. So, where does the, um, great tree send you with winter nipping at your heels? North, naturally. Off to Gindylands, I'm told. And it's not all mysticism, you know. The trees don't actually speak to us. To me, anyway. Blett paused thoughtfully. But I don't have much experience with trees. Being from up in the homes, it's all new to me and terribly interesting. It is interesting. You know, I scarcely believed in the stuff until recently. God knows trees are important, as everyone does, but I mean, all this? He jerked his thumb towards the pine sapling on his back. Seemed like religious pageantry for gardeners. But we came this way to stop by your Teela Hill, and well... Blett passed again and downed the rest of his ale. Something special there. Like there really is something special in that wood. We offered one of our trees there and planted it right at the top. And I mean, there's just something there. He drifted off dreamily, and I myself wondered, thinking of the strange eyes I saw on my journey over Tila Hill. Powers or not, I said, trees are important. In thinking about trees with Yule on the horizon, I wonder if they keep Yule trees in these parts. Blett perked up at that. You mean the thing where folk decorate trees for the winter tide? Oh, that is a great thing. More people must be told of it. Master Skin said it was a silly, mannish trend, but I think it's just lovely. He snapped his stubby fingers and grew even more excited. You can have my tree. It's meant for the fields about Kohara Mountain, but I think... Why, I think keeping it here for the season would spread the word. Raise awareness and such. Let me just check with the boss. But was all I could manage before he hopped clumsily from the stool, bumping his mug on the way down, and trotted across the common room. Kalka! I shouted warily. She was not in sight. Sumi had delivered the bread and was chatting with the other beanbacks. What? came the innkeeper's angry reply. I stuck my head through the doorway to the kitchen. You nearly ruined my partridge berries, Torsen, she seethed. I am sorry. I'll, I'll be more careful next time, honestly. 
She sighed and went back to spooning the barrier reduction into an excellent-looking dough. Then she asked weakly, What do you want? Can we have a Yule tree? Kalka lifted her head up from her partridge berry tarts and squinted with both confusion and frustration. What? This has been The Green Crow Inn by Derek A. Kamal, read by Kalman Friedman, with music by Michael Elliott. To find out more, including how to purchase your copy of the novel, please visit shorelessskies.com.